is the setup the object mass flow into a fluid so the atmosphere for instance or think of a thick, thick fluid one force is a gravitational force right and that's what we see so far when you did projectile motion with Kevin we you just look at the effect of, of the of the gravitational force but another one is could be air resistance or drag force if it's not air that's why it's called so typically you will have say an object maybe a meteor hurling towards earth you have the weight pulling it towards the center of earth but there's also R, R resistance let me yeah and the movie goes all red there go it's about to make it what am I thinking of oh yeah gravity you guys seen gravity huh <laughs> I mean, gravity, the movie. Cedric Villani, who is the Fields Medalist 2010, I think. He called it the most mathemat mathematical movie ever made. Because everything is, all the motion of all, all the objects and, and the animation is made through a computer graphics uh, imaging. But they need to follow the laws of physics, so it looks realistic. Or, realistic, sorry. And... Uh, so it's all based on physics, all based on the laws that we we'll see in the final chapter. We've seen that movie called Life. Yeah, Life. They like to go away, they get a little organism, and then it all turns bad. And then they go back to Earth, they think they send the organism in the space. Yeah, you know that? No? Life. Ryan Gosling. No, not Ryan Gosling. The other one. Ryan Reynolds. Jake Gillenhaar. Gillen, I can't remember his name. Can you see that? You've seen that, no? I recommend it. Much more gruesome than I anticipated. Okay, so we're going to see two cases. The first case is when the resistance is proportional to the speed. And so if you do the fluid mechanics course in third or fourth, in your case it will be in third year, yeah. You will see that's what happens for viscous fluids. You can model that just from the modeling of the fluid, it's pretty nice. Or also that applies pretty well for small objects through air. And the other case we'll treat, and we can also solve it mathematically for sure. It's when the resistance is proportional to the speed squared. So in the second case, you anticipate a nonlinear equation. In the first case, it's a linear equation, so it'd be easy to solve. In the second case, it turns out we can solve it. And that applies pretty well empirically. You can see that it works pretty well to describe the, the air resistance of large objects through the air. Say a parachute, for instance. Okay, well, let's go ahead and do that. Let's do the first case. Drag is proportional to the speed. 
So we're just going to write that down. That's what I have here in the in the frame expression. I just have a constant of proportionality times v the velocity. I put the minus because clearly resistance is going to be against the direction of velocity. Right? If an object's moving in a certain direction, that's the direction of velocity. If there's resistance, it's going to be opposite to that. And then instead of calling the constant, uh, I don't know, k or lambda or whatever, I call that minus bm or minus mb. That's just for convenience. I could have called it minus b, but you will see that the m, if you see this m, it's nicer than everything will cancel out nicely. Okay, x0 is 0, zero p0 is zero, 0. So you just have to think of somebody just jumping off a plane, basically. Just stepping up like that. Not jumping, then just stepping out of a plane. Let's do that. Newton's law. So ma, if I do everything along the vertical axis, the forces are going to be I'm taking the vertical axis downwards, so it's going to be plus mg and v. I expect to increase, so I have to get downwards as well, and then minus mbv the resistance. And so here I see that this is the first order differential equation for v, first order linear. OGE for V. And I know how to solve this, yeah? Uh -huh. I'm right. It's just second nature to me now. I know I have to go through four steps. The first step is to write it in the standard form. So I need to bring my V to the left. I've divided across by M to bring that coefficient to 1. And on the right, I have G. So now I can identify my P and my Q. P is going to be B. That's all I need, in fact, if I want to compute the integrating factor matter, the integrating factor, sorry. It's just going to be this. So that's easy to integrate. Now I know that if I multiply the standard form of the equation across by the integrating factor, I should make the product will appear on the left hand side. So let's check that I'm going at it the right way. Multiplying across. Yeah. Multiply it across. <laughs> I always do that. Why does he always do that? Because students always do that. They always forget the right hand side for some reason. Some of them. And I look at the left hand side, do I see the product rule in action? Do I see u v prime plus u prime v? Yes, sir. I do. Yeah. If I take u as exponential bt, I do indeed have u prime in the second term. So that's all good. I could s I'm on the right tracks. I haven't done any mistakes so far. I can see that this is the same as this. And now I can integrate both sides. Left hand side is just going to be EBV plus a constant. I want to just use constant on the right hand side. Then the integral of this, there's G, which is a constant, and then there's exponential BT. Derivative of exponential is exponential, but it's exponential BT, so the derivative is going to be B exponential BT. I don't want the B, so I'm just going to put 1 over b to prevent that. Yeah, if I differentiate 1 over b exponential bt, I'm going to get 1 over b times b times exponential bt. So I'm going to get, okay, plus the constant. Then I can find v divided across by exponential bt. A 1 over exponential bt, that's exponential minus bt. 
And then I had an initial condition, yeah, V of zero, zero. So I can find C now. C times exponential zero, which is one. So that tells me that C minus T over B. And I finally have my solution, V T equals T over B. Okay, that wasn't too hard. <coughs> yeah, very similar type of equation we saw before. It was easy because P is just B, is just a constant, so it's easy to compute the integrating factor. <coughs> so, just to regroup here, we find that the speed of g over b, I can factorize it. The v of t, the velocity, changes as follows. When t goes to infinity, we see that v times 2 where t only appears in the exponential so exponential t that goes to plus infinity but that's expansion minus t or minus vt so that goes to 0 so I'm just left with g over b and that's the so-called terminal velocity. So that's another one of my mass movie quiz, but if I say which movie is that now, I should have. Have you heard of terminal velocity? Charlie Chin, was it 1992? Like what? 20th century? Okay, so if I was to plot this function here, it would look something like this. It will start strong, but then peter out towards Vt. the terminal velocity. The initial slope, you can compute that by taking the derivative at zero, derivative of one at from the zero, the other derivative expansion uh, derivative of minus exponential minus bt is going to be minus times minus, it's going to be b exponential minus bt, at zero it's going to be b times g over b, so the initial slope is just g yeah, initially you subjected what's the slope, that's the der derivative of the of the function, the derivative of the velocity is the acceleration. Initially, you subject it to acceleration, but then as you keep falling, 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 eventually you won't be accelerated. You're just going to have a steady speed, no more acceleration. And go, ah, like this. <laughs> but you don't hear it because it's all gone. Yeah? Anybody know skydiving? You got to do it. It's just like crazy, but you can, it's just gone. Uh, good fun. Okay. Initial So it's the opposite of the bungee jump. Bungee jump you experience 
a greater acceleration than g here when you just for you just have terminal velocity as t goes to infinity Hmm. Any questions? Did I go too fast anywhere? Yes. Um, so yeah, then B, what is B? That's, if you do that course <laughs> I was telling you about, you will find an expression for B. Where was it? Yeah, if you do fluid mechanics. Basically, it depends on the cross-section of the object, on the viscosity of the fluid. All those things, they, co they, they come into play. At this level, we're just happy to call it B. <coughs> okay. Oh, yeah, we can go further. We can find the, the position, yeah? If we have the velocity, that's dx dt. we can integrate and find the position the integration of a constant that's just a constant times t integration of the exponential well we've just done that something like that plus a constant I just see right here, g over b t minus minus is going to be plus g over b squared plus the constant. You told that zero at zero, so that gives you c. Yeah. And so we found what the distance evolves. Yeah, as t increases, time goes by, that exponential term it's going to become negligible and then you just have linear variation with time of distance which is not that hard to sustain but what happens if the drag force is very small yeah so if there's no drag force then you will expect one half of gt square you will have to expect a quadratic variation with time so let's check if that's correct or if that's consistent so if the drag force is very small, if I take B, sorry, B very small, then I can do a Taylor expansion. Is that in the book? Oh, yeah, Taylor series. Oh, macro and series. That's better. Because I'm close to zero. exponential minus pt that's going to be so if I call this f of t it's going to be close to f of 0 which is 1 plus f prime of 0 so f prime that's going to be minus p exponential minus pt at 0 so that's just going to be minus p prime of 0 times t plus 1 half f double prime I'm going to have to uh, differentiate again uh, this I should have written it I'm going to have b squared and then t squared plus etc alright so if I plug that in there I can see
So I have to put the minus sign now into, in front of this. So I have one, sorry. I have minus the expression I just wrote above. So it's going to be minus one plus pt minus a half, etc. What's that? I can see that the ones cancel out here. And then the t term, I have g over bt, and then I have minus g. Always b squared. Ah. B squared. Then I have minus g over b squared times bt. So that's again the same term, and they also cancel out. So I'm left with minus g over b squared times minus 1 half. So it's going to be plus 1 half. B squared is going to cancel. I'm left with 1 half of g, g squared, which is what I would expect. No inference of the b term now. And I have just free fall. So it's all consistent. Expect. Did. What a nice exercise. Yes, question. You see the, the, the second last line there? Yeah. When you have like dot 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 and there's more numbers there. Yeah. How come you're not counting for them in the second line? Yeah, I could. I could. You're right. I should say plus. So I guess in the next terms, B will play a role. But I know, at least I know that if B is very small, I should be really close to what I found when I was no, no resistance. So you're right. You could either say that's the exact solution, or you could say, oh, the effect is very small, and it's only going to show up at the next term, the term T cubed. Term T squared is the same as if there was no air resistance. So it's nice, consistency. Very important in physics and in applied math to make sure that when you have results, it's consistent with what you know already before. Often that's what you do, right? You have a very simple model, it works to a certain extent, then it doesn't work anymore, so you refine the model, come up with more sophisticated theory, but it has to be consistent. So you, sh you have to check that in the limit where you have neglected those effects you're now accounting for, you're consistent with the previous theory. Just like special relativity is consistent with Newton uh, mechanics, and then general relativity is consistent with special relativity, and so on and so forth. So that's why I was going on about that. Maybe you'll see that later in physics. Uh, but you're right, yeah? I've just, I should add it here. I was just checking for consistency. Plus dot dot dot. Okay. Okay. So let's move on to the other case that's also solvable. It's when the resistance is not proportional to the square speed. So you can see that the only difference now is instead of BV, we're going to have BV squared, or K in that case called K. And it looks like it's in standard form, but no. Well, maybe it's standard form for us. I don't know. Anyway, we won't be able to use the integrating factor method because, sure, dv dt is by itself. That's the term that's linear in dv dt in, in the derivative of v. But v is not by itself. It's squared, quadratic, it's not linear, so it's a nonlinear ODE. First order nonlinear ODE, in general, can't do much. But here we might be able to make progress. Yeah, let's try this. Huh. I thought I had it. Oh, I have to improvise. Let's do it together then. I'm going to do this. 
often, especially if DVD is by itself, you can do separation variables. And let's see if we can hear. Just going to try to put the V on this one side and the T on the other. Yeah, I can. You can write DV KV squared on the left and DT on the right. And then I can integrate both sides. So that's the method of separation of variables. Separation. Uh, what well, about that equation? That the integral on the right, that's easy, that's just t plus constant. The integral on the left, maybe not so easy. So I look at my page 26 of integrals for oh, this one that's not so bad. That's 1 over a squared minus x squared. Yeah, I think that's 1 over. Right? <coughs> so that's the second last in the list. So that k is annoying, so I'll get rid of it. So I'm just going to write it like this. I'm going to bring the k in front. And then I'm going to multiply both sides by the k. where a squared is g over k. Did I go too fast here? You can see I have k, I can bring it to the right hand side, or multiply both sides by k if you want. It will disappear from the left hand side, on the right hand side at k dt. And then at the bottom I'll be left with g over k minus v squared. I'm going to call this a squared because I can see in the list of integrals that the integral of 1 over a squared minus x squared is 1 over 2a log of a plus x over a minus x. I'm just going to write that. So that's nice. There is an integral to this. 1 over 2a a plus b. And on the right hand side, it's just going to be kt plus c. Yeah. And I'm looking for v. So I'm going to multiply both sides by 2a. Plus, I'm just going to call that d now. Right, D is going to be 2AC, but C is arbitrary for the moment, so I can just call it D. I want to arrive at V, so I'm going to take the log on both sides. No, sorry, I'm going to take the exponential on both sides. And then I have exponential d. Okay, I write it here. Exponential d, I'm going to call that, I don't know, another constant e. Okay, I'm nearly there now. I multiply across by a minus v. V. Actually, I should get rid of the E first. Don't want to bother me. Okay, I'll do that first. Sorry, I'm just deleting. I know, what was it that when T is 0, V is 0? So that means A plus 0 over a minus 0 
equals e times exponential zero. So it means that e is one. Yeah, might as well get rid of that e now. So again, I try to arrive at v. So I just multiply across by a minus v, when now e is 1, so I expand. And now v on both sides, I just have one equation for one unknown, which is v. 1 plus a t v on the left and a <coughs> and so on, on the right and finally and b or t equals a what is a it was a square was g over k wasn't it yes so that's going to be square root g over k and then I have a fraction exponential 2k minus 1 plus 1 no it's not right sorry no, it's not clear yeah, I'll make it longer Okay, that's what I have. Wow. wow, not so nice. Well, I can tidy up the square roots. What do I have for my, yes. Okay, I want to do it directly on that expression here. It's going to be square root, oops, sorry, of 2 gk. All right, you all agree? k times square root of g over square root of k. It's going to be square root of k times square root of g, so that's square root of 2 gk. I can do that at the bottom as well. And then look what I'm going to do. Multiply top and bottom Why am I doing that? It's going to be neater. Believe me. So if I have exponential 2a times exponential minus a, so it's going to be exponential a. Uh, here I'm going to be left with 1 square root of j t. And this, I believe, is your first exposure to trigonometric, hyperbolic trigonometry. Have you seen hyperbolic functions before? Hyperbolic cosine, hyperbolic sine, no. Oh, I did have it there. Ah. Okay, so I'll just rewrite it once more. Well, you will see it again and again <coughs> over your degree. That's the so-called hyperbolic tangent 
of square root of gkt tan tan h hyperbolic tangent if you plot it it looks like this again you will have a right it looks very much like the previous one and as t goes to infinity you can see that the exponential minuses they go to zero the exponential plus they go to infinity but they cancel out top and bottom so you end up with the general velocity equals square root of g over k okay so just to give you a taster of things to come I'm introducing what's called the hyperbolic cosine and the hyperbolic sine these are functions that you will come across and that's how they define one half okay why are they called cos and sines hyperbolic cos and sines because look notice what happens if I differentiate it the first one exponential t that's the derivative is exponential t exponential minus t is going to be minus exponential t over 2 the derivative of the first one is the second one and the derivative of the second one is going to be the first one and that's reminding you of similar to derivative of sine is cos and derivative of cos is minus sine up to a sine yeah. and so inter 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 exchange like this between the functions and then just like you can define the cos and the sine the hyperbolic one, you can also define the tangent if I was to divide the cinch that's how you say it with the cosh you end up with that function here yeah. nice so if you look at the point of view of geometry you know that the point at x cos cos t y equals sine t is on a circle But now if you look at the point at x equals cosh t cinch t and you compute x squared and y squared you will find that if you do one minus the other you will be left Oh, yeah, yeah. When you square them, you have et squared plus e minus t squared plus 2 times et times e minus t, which is just 1. Yes. You have the 1 quarter and so on and so forth. But you could see, you could check it. It's going to be on this curve here. You could check that x squared minus y squared is 1. And that's the curve, that's the plot of a hyperbola. Hence the term hyperbolic trigonometry. We can do all sorts of experiments and connections with, you know, regular trigonometry. Fantastic. Love these guys. Now, the way they look is completely different now because they're not periodic. Both the cosh and the cinch go to infinity. The cinch is odd and the cos is even just like the cos and the sines are odd and even and then the tans just goes like this goes towards a limit above plus and minus infinity so we saw that right hand side and then it's it's odd so 
it's going to behave in the opposite way on the opposite side. How about that? You'll see it over and over again. It used to be seen in the living cert, not anymore. So you'll have to figure out as we go along. It's going to come back in second, in second year, probably in methods as well, maths methods. Okay. Isn't mechanics just great? You think of a simple problem and you just realize that you need more maths. And yet, and yet you have a good, good set of tools already to solve those problems. I think mechanics is the best. Okay. Thanks for coming.